And to uh, chair the first session, we have Professor Hans van Vries of University College uh, London, an expert on archaic Greek warfare and many other things too. So I'll pass over to you, Hans. Thank you, uh, Dominic. It's a great pleasure uh, to be here to introduce our, uh, our, our programme of speakers. Uh, uh, if Dominic's an enthusiast for some night uh, equipment, uh, I am going to be one for Greek uh, equipment. So very pleased to be chairing the, the first part of this, the non-Roman part, which I tend to think of as the, uh, the good bit. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I think there may be other people joining us in the afternoon who uh, like Roman legionaries, where they will, they will get what they want. But uh, to, uh, first of all, we start with um, uh, one of my uh, personal uh, heroes, uh, Professor Peter Kretz. Um, who is a pioneer, who has been a pioneer of the study of Greek warfare, um, a pioneer of a particular school of thought about Greek warfare, uh, let, let me say, um, and I've, I've learned a great deal from him. Uh, he is the, the W.R. Gray Professor of Classics and History at uh, Davison College in North Carolina, um, and he's here to speak today on the topic of um, uh, Marathon to Chironea, uh, Changes in Hope Light Armour. I'm delighted to have the chance to kick off this day. It should be a great day, and I'm delighted to see so many people here. I'm especially delighted to see a few people many years younger than I am out in the audience. You're looking at uh, a grave monument, a grave stele that was found about 30 years ago in Piraeus, the port city of Athens, by accident, by a machine digging a water conduit. It's almost three and a half meters tall, so it's a huge thing. It was erected to commemorate a man named Pancaris, uh, and in the relief, you see a bareheaded horseman wearing a muscle cuirass and a Phrygian helmet uh, attacking from the left. Uh, he wears a uh, sword, and his arm is raised, presumably, uh, to carry a spear that would have been painted. His horse tramples another man who is nude, but is carrying a hop white shield, which is that distinctive concave round shield with an offset rim. So please notice the rim. And defending him is a third man, the largest of the three, who st steps towards the horseman and is likewise armed with a muscle cuirass, a Phrygian helmet, uh, and a hoplite shield. In the original publication of this uh, relief, and I'm going to use it to kind of spin my talk around, uh, Eleni Papastavrou dated the stele near the middle of the fourth century, and she thought that the horseman's hair uh, looked like Alexander the Great's hair. And that, I think, was partly why she suggested that Pancaris died at the Battle of Chironia or Chironia in 338, the famous but very poorly documented battle in which Philip defeated a coalition of Greek states. Now, my suspicion is that she might also have been influenced, perhaps uh, unconsciously, by the interpretation of that battle by a very distinguished historian, N.G.L. Hammond, who first publishes uh, his, his uh, interpretation in 1938. And the way he looked at the battle, Philip's problem was how, with his lighter-armed phalanx, to defeat the heavy-armed Greek hoplite line. And the solution that Hammond proposed was that Philip created a gap in the hoplite line through which Alexander, his son, in command of cavalry on the left wing, charged. And then that was the decisive moment of the battle. Hammond pushed this interpretation throughout his very long life. He, uh, he wrote individual volumes on Philip and on Alexander. He wrote a survey of Greek history. I imagine many of you are familiar with his different writings, and he modified the interpretation slightly, but the gist of it was the same throughout, and it now dominates scholarship. And the image of Alexander riding to victory on a horse is really hard to resist, e even as a teenager. I think this image is one that we all <laughs> recognize. So I'm a historian, and what I'd like to do in the next few minutes is to re-examine the assumption behind Hammond's interpretation, namely the assumption that Philip's men were more likely equipped than the Greeks. I've divided what I have to say into three parts or three acts. So act one is what type of gear 
uh, were the Greeks carrying at the Battle of Marathon in 490. Uh, act two is what changes took place in the next century and a half. And then act three, this really isn't reflected in my title. I changed, the talk changed a little bit as I created it. Uh, act three is the Macedonian side. And throughout, we'll come back to that Stele of Pancaris a number of times. There's no proof that that has anything to do with the Battle of Chironia. But I find it useful to think with, and I hope you, uh, I hope you will enjoy thinking with me on that. So, Act 1. What did uh, archaic warriors use down to the Battle of Marathon? Here's the famous little pot, the Kiji Ope, which has an exquisite rendering of a line of hoplites, and you see that they wear a bronze Corinthian helmet, they wear a bronze uh, cuirass, bronze shin guards, uh, they carry the round hoplite shield, and here they each have two spears, later a single spear and a sword becomes the standard. Now, how much did all this weigh? In 1852, and this, this book is hard to read because it's written in that old German Fraktur uh, print, which at least I struggle with. Uh, Wilhelm Rustow and Hermann Kechli published this famous volume in which they, among many other things, estimated the weight of the individual pieces of equipment. As you see on the right, they came up with a total of 72 pounds. You still see this figure repeated uh, sometimes exactly as 72 pounds, other times 70 pounds or more frequently. Victor Davis Hansen in particular is frequently referred to the heavy 70 plus pounds that they carried. Now because they were Germans, and I embarrassed myself at another conference by not knowing this, because you, I'm sure you're all gonna laugh, because they were Germans, they were using German pounds which were half kilogram pounds. So actually, their 79 pounds were uh, 36 kilograms, uh, excuse me, their 72 pounds were 36 kilograms or 79 of the pounds we use more familiarly. Now this figure was always too high. It's, uh, the estimate for the weight of the shield in particular was, was way too high. They, they in fact were talking about a, a, a big oval shield, not about the round uh, spies. And they thought the round shield weighed only about half as much. So when you, when you make that correction, the weight gets down to about 29 kilograms. But this was only an estimate. This is 1852. It's before, it's, it's 25 years until the excavations start at Olympia and we actually start having large numbers of actual remnants of ancient Greek equipment. So they, they did not weigh equipment and they did not try to reconstruct any of the equipment. So these were just guesses. Now scholars who have actually weighed surviving examples uh, and reconstructors who have um, reconstructed equipment, and we'll hear a lot more about that in the second talk today, uh, have come up with uh, interesting results. In general, the uh, weights are, were still too high, even reduced as I showed you down to the 29 kilograms, that's still too high. So at Olympia, there are literally uh, some hundreds of Corinthian helmets. Uh, and when you look at those helmets, they weigh less than the estimates and they get lighter as time goes by. The brass plates could weigh as much as the estimates, but they could weigh less. Uh, the thinner ones weigh only about half as much. Uh, as you see at Olympia, the breastplates uh, outnumber, or the helmets outnumber the breastplates by a factor of almost eight to one, which is part of why Eero Yarva suggested that actually many hoplites might not have ever worn bronze breastplates, but might have always worn something made out of perishable materials, such as the one on the gray steely of Aristion. And I'm not gonna say any more about this now, this, according to vase painting, does become the most common thing, at least for the Athenians, by Marathon. I'm going to skip this because talk number two is all about this, and you're already looking at a reconstructed one in front of me. Uh, Professor Aldretti's uh, best one, the one he described as his best model, weighs only four kilograms. And I'll let him say more about that. Similarly for the shield. The shield could weigh as much as the estimate, uh, but it could also weigh much less for two reasons. One is that the shield did not have to have the bronze cover. So uh, Henry Bly's reconstruction of the best surviving uh, example of this type of shield, which is an Etruscan one in the Vatican Museum, his total reconstruction weighed 6.2 kilograms, and of that, the bronze covering was about three. 
so it weighs only uh, three plus kilograms if you don't have the bronze covering, which you did not have to have. It didn't actually do much in terms of defensive protection. The real work was done by the wood. The other uh, thing that has become recognized more and more recently is, that, is the kind of wood. There are very few examples that uh, survive with enough wood to let you know what kind it is, but the ones that are are either willow or poplar, and poplar weighs way less than hardwood does. So uh, reenactors have now started making shields out of poplar, and the weight has come way down. So Matthew Ompt and Craig Sitch, I don't know if any of you are reenactors in the, in the room, but if you might be familiar with some of these. Uh, these are two of the more serious ones. Uh, Craig Sitch in particular does really wonderful work in Australia. And they've both managed to produce a hot white shield without the bronze cover that weighs only 4.3 kilograms. Put all this together, and uh, what I would conclude, and I think this is not really very arguable, I think that, uh, that by the time of the Battle of Marathon, things have gotten lighter, so that uh, for the Athenians at any rate, at Marathon, they could have worn all of those pieces of equipment and carried about half as much as the estimate had been. That's fully equipped. They aren't all fully equipped. So if you look at the vase paintings of the time of the Persian Wars, you see some Athenians fighting wearing nothing more than uh, a tunic, such as the man on the top right here on this cup. And I'd like to think that this painted play pack shows somebody running into the Battle of Marathon. There's no way to, to prove that, but here's an even more likely equipped example. So I don't think this is, uh, should be very controversial. I think that uh, time of the Battle of Marathon, you could get all the equipment uh, and still be under 20 kilograms. So Act Two, how did things change between Marathon and the Battle of Chironia in the next 150 years? Here things get very controversial, and this is why. Well, there are three reasons why. Reason number one, for whatever reason, about the middle of the fifth century, the Greeks seem to have stopped dedicating armor at the big sanctuaries such as Olympia, where we found so much of it from the Archaic period. So there are literally fewer examples found. On it, as you get farther into the 5th century. A second difficulty is that the pottery changes. Again, uh, it's hard to know exactly why this happens, but scenes of warfare, of, of fighting, uh, become less common on red figure pottery as time goes by. And after about uh, 370 or so, red figure pottery itself becomes less common uh, so that we have many fewer visual images to look at. And then the third problem is uh, literary. So Xenophon, the last of the three great historians, ends his Hellenica in uh, 362, so that the generation before the Battle of Chironia, we really have no contemporary historical sources. And the sources that we wind up relying on turn out to be a couple hundred years later. So for all those reasons, uh, things get much more difficult. And I expect, some, I expect some hard questions about uh, the next part. So until the 60s, as best I can tell, nobody had really uh, thought much about changes in armor. And when Hammond wrote, when he was talking about hot whites at Chironi, he was basically thinking of them being pretty much the same as they'd been at the Battle of Marathon. In the 60s, uh, Anthony Snodgrass, in his uh, little book on Greek armor, suggested that things continue to get lighter. And J.K. Anderson's uh, volume on military theory and practices uh, in the age of Xenophon took this to an extreme point of view, and that's what I want to look at next. So what's the evidence that uh, things got still lighter? First of all, the helmet. So the helmet had already gotten some lighter, and, and Greeks had started using more and more open-faced helmets. By the end of the 5th century, the helmet called a pilos has become quite common. Pilos means felt, and it originally seems to have been a kind of stiff felt cap worn by shepherds and other rather humble people. It gets turned into bronze, at least by the time of Aristophanes, who refers to a bronze one in one of his plays. Uh, and so one issue is just when we see a pilos, is it bronze or is it felt? There's at least one grave monument you see it here on the right, in which the pilos is clearly crushable, so it's clearly felt. And Anderson thought that the Spartan hoplites 
at Sphacteria, where Thucydides says their Piloi did not keep off arrows, Anderson thinks that the Spartans at Pylos were wearing only felt Piloi, not bronze. <coughs> Second aspect, since you all came here thinking about body armor, I bet you've all noticed that this man is not wearing any. He's wearing an exomese, which is a kind of tunic. It's really a working man's tunic. It fastens only over the left shoulder. It leaves his right arm free. It's a very humble garment. Uh, the exomese becomes quite common on tombstones by the end of the 5th century. Here are a couple more of them. And there are also ones from at least three places outside Athens, including a half dozen or so from Thebes. The Theban ones are really interesting. They're done on a kind of uh, black stone. They're hard to see. The, uh, the, the engraving, rather than being a relief, it's kind of engraved or etched into the stone. So I give you a drawing of it on the right so you can see that a little better. Anderson also pointed to some literary passages, which I'm not going to take the time to go through, but there are a number of uh, several passages in Xenophon's Anabasis, which suggests that the mercenaries fighting in the East in 401 were not all wearing body armor. Uh, and there's also a passage in Diodorus when he describes Dionysius I equipping an army to fight against the Carthaginians in 399. Uh, Diodorus says that he provided his officers with breastplates and other equipment, but the infantry got no breastplates. So there are a number of uh, literary texts that support what we see on the tombstones, which is people fighting with no, literally no chest protection or greaves at all. And Anderson concluded that by the end of the fifth century, hoplites were depending mainly on their shields for protection. A recent study by Patricia Hanna uh, this came out about five years ago, supports this conclusion. I just want to mention this briefly. She looked at uh, the remains of what are known as warrior lutrophoroi. A lutrophoros, you see it, uh, one of them sketched on the left here, is a particular type of vase that carried water that was used apparently for purification rituals at weddings and at funerals of unmarried men and women. There is a, there, there's a group of about 40 of these. Apparently the custom was to break them at funerals because the 40 have all been found smashed into pieces. So they're all, they're all in pieces and they span the fifth century. And just to give you the big picture, what she found was that by the end of the fifth century, no one was wearing a corslet. No one was wearing a shin guard. They all had only an exomese or a, a chitin or a regular tunic. So there's nothing glamorous about an exomese to my mind, which uh, really does make the hoplite look like a day laborer out there smashing stones or building a wall. Uh, so I agree with Anderson that many hoplites by the end of the fifth century were not wearing defensive uh, body armor. Their families could afford these nice sculpted tombstones, so they're not the very poorest of the Athenians either. So these are the hoplites. I bet a lot of you have seen this picture uh, in Nick Secunda's Osprey volume on the, uh, uh, the Greek hoplite. Uh, this is what he's showing you here, is these hoplites are wearing no body armor. Personally, I think, this, uh, uh, I think this illustration is misleading. I'm not convinced that there was ever a battle in which no soldier wore body armor. There are still examples of people wearing defensive equipment. Uh, and Xenophon and Diodorus, at least, suggest that at least officers were wearing body armor. Uh, here's one example. This comes, comes from Lycia. Uh, but I went and looked at this again yesterday. This is in the British Museum, the famous Nereid Monument. And there are uh, lots of guys wearing corslets on the Nereid Monument. Here you see an archer, and I think it's uh, five hoplites, three of whom are wearing, wearing corslets of the type that Professor Aldredi is going to talk about in a few minutes. On the very next page of that same Osprey volume, you see this much more depressing looking picture because it's the aftermath of battle. But what you see on this picture is that every single fighter, except those that have been stripped of their armor, all the ones that still have their equipment on, they're all wearing a Phrygian helmet and a muscle cuirass. A muscle cuirass uh, is kind of a descendant of the older bronze bell-shaped cuirass. Uh, it typically has, a, it extends a little bit down over the groin, uh, and it's more closely fitted to the musculature of the individual. 
Uh, this, this reflects Nick Secunda's view that there was a major change. So in his, in his interpretation, he accepts Anderson's view that late fifth century, very little body equipment. But he thinks that around 360, in response to the Macedonians, people rearmed and that they once again started wearing much heavier equipment. So the muscle cuirass does go back. It does show up on Greek red figure vase paintings starting about 480. It's not particularly common. What makes Secunda think that it got more common are grave monuments. So here are a couple of, of examples. These are even fancier tombstones, uh, almost little buildings that show you a couple of men wearing these muscle cuirasses. On your right, you see one who actually has the Phrygian helmet on too. The Phrygian helmet uh, appears on Attic Great Relief starting about 380. Uh, it seems to have come from the north or perhaps from Asia Minor. It might become common because the Athenians started campaigning in that region in about 380. And it's another example of something that may have been originally felt or leather and was then turned into metal. But I'm not persuaded uh, by this argument that everybody rearmed. Uh, there are really not so many of these tombstones and, it, uh, and not so many of these examples of it either. Uh, it seems to me perfectly possible that there could have been some officers wearing this equipment, but that the mass of troops might still have been relatively lightly armed. So to come back to our Pancari's relief, I would say that the uh, striding hoplite with all the equipment could have been one of these Athenian officers. There are a couple reasons, though, uh, to wonder whether the Athenian might, in fact, not be the horseman rather than the uh, striding hoplite. And I've kind of left you a clue. So one thing to think about is the vase that is carved on the bottom of the relief. That's a Lutrophoros, right? And I've already told you about a Lutrophoros. So the Lutrophoros on a tomb monument, what does that suggest to you? I'm looking at the younger members of the audience, <laughs> neither of whom is volunteering. So uh, to me it suggests that the, uh, the person being commemorated was unmarried, was a younger man. So of those figures, who looks younger? Well, the, the man on the horseback is, is a little smaller and he's not bearded. He clearly looks like the younger one to me. But probably more important than that is that this pose turns out to be a kind of standard pose in funerary architecture or funerary monuments. Uh, it's been dubbed the Dexilius motif after this famous tombstone found in the Karamic Coast in Athens, uh, which has an inscription with it. It was in honor of a horseman who died at a battle in 394-3. So he's not shown as the guy getting killed. He's shown as victorious, even though in fact he died during the battle. Does that make sense? There are a number of uh, both tombstones and uh, reliefs that go with casualty lists that show various versions of this motif, a victorious horseman over uh, hoplites down and out. And in all cases, it looks like the Athenian, the one, ones being commemorated as dead, are shown in the victorious pose. The, the uh, best comparison is this one. This turned up, this has still not been properly published to, to the best of my knowledge. If somebody knows differently, please tell me after the lecture. Uh, this was found in the Metro excavations in Athens. And it's, as far as I know, it's only been published in the, the color volume that came out of the finds from the Metro excavations before the 2004 Olympics. And you see it's got the same basic pose. Horsemen coming in, uh, attacking from the right towards the left, one man down on the ground, another man still defending him, striding towards the right. It's very similar to uh, the Pancari's relief. And here, uh, it's on top of a list of dead horsemen from the first decade of the Peloponnesian War. The horseman wears exactly the equipment that Xenophon, an experienced horseman himself, would have an Athenian horseman wear, with the exception of he should be wearing a helmet. Now, uh, what this looks like to you, I don't know. He looks at least as much like 
this bareheaded Athenian on the Parthenon frieze, which I also checked in on yesterday, uh, he looks at least as much like that guy as he does like Alexander the Great in the Pompeii mosaic. So I don't see why he can't be an Athenian who's lost his hat. So that brings me to Act 3. So if the Athenian ought to be the horseman, then can a Macedonian be wearing a Phrygian helmet, a muscle cuirass, and carrying a hot white shield in 338? So a little background on the Macedonians. Uh, Philip became king in 359 after a disastrous battle in which 4,000 Macedonians, including his brother, were killed. And he put together a new army, um, which was, and the old view is that the new army that he put together, since he put it together in a, quite emergency situations, was uh, a lightly equipped army, which did not wear breastplates or corslets, used smaller, lighter shields, and defended itself really with the massive sarissus, or the massive long pikes, basically to keep the enemies at a distance so that it didn't matter that they had less defensive equipment. These are the Macedonians that Hammond had in mind. And I promised my wife I would not read a PowerPoint to you. So I'm not going to read this. Uh, th this view was based primarily on literary evidence. It's later literary evidence. The first famous passage here from Polyanus describes the training of the Macedonians. And you see mentioned there the sarissas, the pikes, the, uh, uh, the shields called peltai, not the hoplite shields. And you do not see there any mention of chest protectors of any kind. And we know from Aristotle what a, what a pelte was. It was a shield without a rim. Uh, could be covered with bronze, but it's without a rim. And uh, as for how big it was, there are several Hellenistic writers that describe it as uh, eight palms in diameter, which in Hammond's time they thought that was 60 centimeters, maybe a little bit more. So if that's what all the Macedonians were wearing, then our hoplite and the Pancardi's relief can't be a Macedonian, right? So archaeology has also changed the discussion about Macedonian equipment. Uh, it started um, almost a century later, really, than the, than the excavations in central and southern Greece. Macedonian archaeology had really kicked off uh, in a major way in the 1970s, uh, the most famous excavation being the one at Vergina, but there are many other uh, excavations that had big finds starting in the 1970s. So we have found some fragments of shields. One came from Olympia. It's the only classical one. And it's clearly not a real one. It's only about half the size of even a small real one. So it's a model dedicated. But it shows you what a shield would look like. And then there are a couple other ones. And they tend to fall into two different sizes, one about 66 centimeters, one about 75 uh, centimeters. One of them even has the name of the king on the shield. This one was discovered in 1999. So these are, some of these are quite recent finds. The other place where uh, Macedonian archaeology has really proved interesting is tombs, uh, and especially in tombs paintings. Now, these, are, these are a distinctive kind of burial which is not found in southern Greece. And I'm going to show you one that I find just fascinating. I've not ever seen this personally. Uh, this one was found in the 1994. It was published in Greek in 2005. So I'm, I would guess that many of you are not familiar with this tomb. It's a tomb found at Ios Athanasios and published by Maria Tsibidu Avlonidi. And typical Macedonian tomb has a painted exterior. And on this exterior, you see two men sort of guarding the door of the tomb. And then I'm going to start with the little frieze that goes right across the top of the door. That frieze, on the left you see some horsemen coming in. There's to a dinner party in the middle. And on the right, there are eight soldiers, uh, relaxed soldiers, not fighting, they're relaxed. Uh, and I just wanted to start looking at those. So of those eight, uh, the three on the left are all wearing corsets. And they have kind of small spears, it seems to me. The five on the right, uh, they're interesting. Not a single one has a corslet on. The two uh, on the left of those five have Phrygian helmets with rather dramatic plumes. Uh, some of the, the others of them, a couple are bareheaded. The ones on the left and the one in the middle here are wearing a kausia, a kind of uh, probably a leather cap. Uh, so they vary in what they have on their heads. 
they're quite relaxed, so they, we don't have to assume that these are armed going into battle. And the other thing I would point to here is that the shield, second from the left on this slide, is noticeably smaller than the other two shields. These shields all look like they don't have much of a rim. They all look uh, similar to those bronze examples that I showed you earlier. The guards, who have this wonderful, sorrowful appearance as if they're mourning the loss of the dead man, uh, are not actually life-size. And by my crude calculation, if you blew them up a little bit so they were life-size, those spears, which everybody looks at those and we all think Sarissa, right? That's way longer than a Greek hoplite spear. Uh, but it's not as long as people think Sarissa's are. It, it's a little over three meters long. It's not five meters long. And the shields are really interesting. The shields here do have emblems on them, which is typical of a hoplite shield, which can really only be held one way because of its double grip. Uh, and the Macedonian shields don't have emblems like that. And both of these do seem to have a rim. Now we're looking at it straight on, so you can't tell the profile, but they do look like they have a rim. And again, my calculation would be that they're about 85 centimeters in diameter, which would put them on the smaller end, but within the range of hoplite shields. So in this one tomb, we have quite the mix of equipment, including three different sizes of shields, including hoplite shields. Are there other examples of hoplite shields in 4th century Macedonia? Yes, there are. Uh, there's one of these uh, tomb sculptures, very similar to the one in Athens, uh, that there is a half white shield on there. It's kind of hard to make out, but on the lower left, I think you can see the curve of the rim. That's very late 5th century from Pella. There's a tomb that has one uh, on the wall of the first chamber high up on the wall with a clear rim and a shield emblem. That's in the second quarter of the, of the century. Philip's tomb has probably ceremonial armor, but massive armor with a huge half white shield. Uh, the shield monument at Dion is very interesting. Now we're getting down to the last quarter of the, of the 4th century at the earliest. Here we have an alternating pattern of, of stone shields, which are clearly hoplite shields with the, the concave shape and the rim. And in between them, we have uh, corslets and uh, the metal cuirasses, the muscle cuirasses. All of, the, all of those things have been found uh, since the 70s. I, I want to uh, give you one last example. This one was found at the very end of the 19th century. It's the famous Alexander sarcophagus, now in Istanbul, uh, discovered in 1887. And if you look at the fighting scenes on this sarcophagus, here you have uh, one of Alexander's men wearing a hot white shield. It's a rather flat shield as far as these things go armed with a corslet, like the one right in front of me, uh, and a Phrygian helmet. If you look up at the pediments, and I'm sorry I, don't, I have a drawing, I couldn't get a photo of this. If you look at the pediments, you see more of these guys wearing the corslets, uh, hot white shields, and Phrygian helmets. And the one on the right of center here, oops, wrong direction. The man on the right here has lost his helmet. But I think you can see he's wearing a muscle cuirass, so if you put his helmet back on him, he could, in fact, be our man on the Pancari's relief. So where does this all leave us? Most of this iconographic evidence is later than the time of Philip and the Battle of Chironia. I, I restricted myself to the 4th century, but a lot of it's later than the Battle of Chironia. We don't have much good evidence for how things developed during Philip's rule. It's certainly the case that Philip made a lot of money. And if he had wanted to equip his men in 338 more heavily than he did when he first became king 21 years earlier, he certainly could have done that. Uh, so, oh, and just one other detail. Demosthenes in 341 does refer to Philip's men as hoplites, not as peltas, which might su suggest that in fact he had armed at least some of them more heavily. So my conclusion is that uh, Hamlin's initial assumption is uh, it, I guess I don't, I don't believe it at all. It seems to me there's evidence both that many Greeks were more lightly armed, and on the other end, there's evidence that many Macedonians were more heavily armed. Uh, so I don't see any reason why we need to invent a gap in the, in the phalanx or a cavalry charge that no source mentions, and I would, in trying to understand the battle, go back to what the sources do say, which is to credit Philip's 
leadership and the greater training of his troops. Thanks very much. Original stimulating and then boosted uh, lecture. Um, I uh, just, just one brief comment uh, because it relates to the Peter Connolly exhibition. You mentioned this uh, reconstructed uh, trust and shield, and uh, as luck would have it, we've got uh, Peter Connolly's painting of that up in the library. So if you want to, uh, to see that in, uh, in wonderful color and detail, uh, go and have a look. Um, just one very quick question before I hand over to, to others. Um, your, your observation that um, uh, body armor, if anything, amongst the, the Greeks seems to become less and less you know, in the late 5th century, would you say there might be a, a connection with a greater density of formation so that the body armor becomes less necessary as the formation becomes more organized, more closely packed perhaps? Would that be a possibility? Yeah, that's a, that's a great suggestion. Do I believe it? Um, <laughs> so he's, he's partly referring to it, the view that the two of us share which is that in archaic Greek, Greece, uh, the, the phalanx was not necessarily an exclusive phalanx, and that many lighter armed people might have still been within the phalanx. So you might have had a combination, phalanx wasn't even a word used at that time. Uh, so you might have had a group of people fighting, some of whom were more lightly equipped, some of whom were heavily equipped. Uh, and so the heavily equipped ones could rely on the lightly equipped ones to defend them against certain kinds of assaults in the battle. Uh, after Marathon, I think that the clearly things change and the Greeks start to fight in more distinct groups. So is this because they, um, they wanted to fight closer together uh, or not? I don't know that I'm convinced that they necessarily fought more closely together. I probably should think about this a whole lot more. <laughs> but it, it seems possible to me that uh, as some places are developing some pretty sophisticated use of light arm troops in coordinated, in coordinated groups rather than just mixed in, that one way to respond to that would be to lighten the equipment of what the hoplites were wearing so that they could deal with the lighter arm troops better. Hoplites, in fact, are quite versatile troops. They, they do all sorts of things. They don't just fight in set piece battles. I, my favorite thing in the British Museum, which I also looked at again yesterday, uh, on that Nereid monument, my favorite bit of that monument, I'm sure uh, probably all of you have seen it, is the little piece of the frieze where a bunch of hoplites carrying these big round shields are climbing ladders trying to get into a city wall. So uh, to my mind, uh, you know, people thought this hoplite shield was a great piece of equipment that uh, was worth carrying, in, even in a really awkward situation such as climbing a ladder. And I think it's possible that, uh, especially after all the casualties of the Peloponnesian War, that more people were being pressed into service who didn't have all the equipment. In the, this is probably stating the obvious, but in the Greek world, uh, you weren't supplied with your equipment. The Athenians showed up with, they had to purchase their own equipment or steal it off a corpse or you know, get it, inherit it from dead. They had to get their own equipment. So it's a, it would be a mistake to imagine the army as all looking the same. I guess that's a pretty guarded answer to that question. Another question. Yeah, well, I know to the floor, yes. Uh, we have a microphone over here, so anyone uh, just uh, raise your hand? Uh, back to the back, there, the middle, uh, Um, the assumption behind my question might be mistaken, but in talking about hoplites, would you ever distinguish between citizen hoplites and the growing or the developing profession of mercenary hoplites, um, who might, I assume, be unrepresented in the arts, but also might have to travel further independently to seek employment? And maybe be have heavier equipment because the employers might think they were would do a better job in heavier equipment. So yes, I think that's possible. I saw other hands up earlier, so 
There's one down here. Oh, sorry. Okay. The exhibition a short time ago, I saw a company that was selling an example of what they claimed was 320 BC Macedonian armor. What struck me with by this was it was wasted. It was a cuirass. It was wasted in the sense of W A I S T E D. It had large shoulders, and I thought, quite frankly, it would fit a girl. And the helmet wouldn't fit any of us in here either. That would fit a child. Um, have you come across any examples of this sort of armor? I think my short answer is no. I'm not thinking of it. Catch me afterwards and tell me exactly where you saw it. In in danger of asking an expert a question and uh, expose my own ignorance. Um, to what extent might the lightning of armour be in response to the fact that before the Persian invasion, hoplites fought hoplites, and it was heavy infantry battles, and with the Persian invasion, they were exposed to whole new ranges of enemies with very mixed arms and armour, they were exposed to light troops and cavalry, and they had to adjust their equipment and tactics or, um, or lose. Uh, my sense of it would be it went the opposite way. So before the Persian Wars, there are archers and there are other light armed people who are fighting. Uh, what I think is one of the really interesting things about the Battle of Marathon is that Herodotus says the Persians were surprised that they to see the Athenians charging at them without any horsemen and without any archers. So that the Persians knew, they had Hippias, the former Athenian tyrant, with them, so they knew what to expect from the Athenians. So I think the implication is the Athenians had horsemen, had lighter armed troops, but none of those were charging. So wh why aren't they charging? My answer would be all the guys got off horses, all the light armed picked up hot bike equ equipment as best they could, some of them maybe not much equipment like that ceramic plaque, and, and charged and fought the Persians hand to hand in a way that the Persians uh, weren't used to. But then I think as you move down towards Plataea, then you do see the Greeks trying to develop contingents to respond to the Persian contingents. So I, I think the, uh, I think in some ways maybe the Persians were ahead of the Greeks in, in developing different groups. That, that's what I'd say. The, the huge difficulty about the archaic period, and I get, I've gotten quite frustrated about it. I don't know how you feel about it, but uh, the two of us were at a conference at Yale a couple years ago, which, uh, and there's a book on this called Men, and, Men, Men of Bronze, Men of Bronze, uh, which is the papers at this conference. And, you know, there were people talking on the two directions, and we just couldn't agree. And uh, minds were not changed. And the problem, of course, is that, you know, we don't have any descriptions of battles from the archaic period. It's all retrojecting things said by Thucydides and other classical authors and arguing that, that you know, it's not that way now, but it used to be that way in the archaic period. Uh, and the vase painting and other artistic evidence is highly controversial. There's one in the middle back. Okay, that's the nearest. And then there's a gentleman over here, fifth row from the front. Thank you very much. How much do you think the lightning of equipment has to do with the cost and the canopy? I think it's been suggested that hot line equipment, the shield, the armor, the helmet, overall, might not be that expensive. I think uh, Steam Shares brought it in about 100 drachmas. Mm. Do you see it as more than that, or do you see it as less? Um, the shift from, say, the Corinthian helmet, which has to be made for an individual, to a pilot's helmet, which can be mass produced and fit more than one person, is that some sort of shift to a cheaper mass produced equipment? No, uh, I'm skeptical. I guess I'm skeptical about whether the equipment would have been that much cheaper. The, the, I mean, the striking thing about those those tombstones are nice tombstones. Uh, the people, so the people shown on those tombstones, if that's how they really fought, with you know, with no corslet at all, it's not because they couldn't have afforded it, because they could afford that tombstone. So I think something else has to be going on there. Can I answer a question no one's asked me? Because I really thought somebody would. <laughs> I, I well, I'm, I'm in a position to uh, expose my own ignorance here. Uh, this concept in the iconography of uh, the 
the warrior on the horse and the dying man beneath. Uh, eight centuries later, uh, I see it on the Whitcomb warrior of Dorsetshire, uh, and he's certainly not Greek. Uh, are there earlier examples before this uh, 4th century BC that exist of a warrior on a horse? Is this a, a concept in iconography that runs through many, many years? All right, that is a great question, and I don't know the answer, so I should say I don't know the answer. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> uh, my, the place to look would not be so much on tombstones, because there aren't big tombstones like that earlier, uh, but on vase painting. <clears throat> is it possible that uh, uh, they carry their soul? because they're not bringing servants to the battle in the way that they did. So for Tia, I think people got seven servants each. And you could expect later on an officer to have servants. But if the hoplites have campaigned more and not taken servants, they won't have people to carry the extra kit. That, that certainly seems like a possible part of the explanation to me. Here's my question I was thought somebody was going to ask, which is a good question, so I'll just preempt anybody <laughs> who's thinking of it. Uh, so, it's not like we have 3,000 objects that show those people fighting with no chest protection, only with an exomese. So are those vase paintings and are those tombstones really reliable? Or could there be some other explanation? And uh, Tomas Schaefer has written a book arguing for another explanation. So since I'm at the speaker's podium, I'll just add this a little bit. He thinks that those are attempts to heroize the dead man by making him more like Theseus. So you all know the story of Theseus? So Theseus is the illegitimate son of the previous Greek king who impregnated a girl in Troyzen, and uh, when he left, he put a sword and a pair of sandals under a huge rock and told her when the boy grew up, if he, if he could move the rock, he should you know, take the sandals and the sword and go to Athens. So Theseus grows up, does that, goes to Athens, so he has very little equipment. And on the way, and for the rest of his life, he does a whole series of heroic things. So he's very much the youthful hero. And he does become more prominent in Athenian art in the middle, after 470 or so. There was a, there was a story, actually, that an Athenian general found his bones on the island of Skyros and brought them back to Athens. So the hypothesis was that these, these uh, works of art are trying to call to mind Theseus. And I did kind of stick in my talk some of the reasons why I don't like that, so I hope you're already thinking of some of those. Uh, one would be that these are not found just in Athens. So why would Thebans be trying to make somebody look like Theseus? That doesn't make sense. Uh, they're not just the Athenians, they're sometimes both if there are two people on the relief, sometimes both of them are armed like that, so one of them is not an Athenian. Uh, and sometimes they're clearly not young. Sometimes they have beards. So I, wasn't, I, I think that's an interesting argument and a good reminder that all the iconography is not photography, uh, and, and we always need to think about other kinds of explanations, but I don't find that one persuasive. Was anybody about to ask that question just out of curiosity? <laughs> Sorry. Um, you mentioned um, during your speech that um, there were certain hoplite shields that were around 75 centimeters in size. Um, that just seemed a little bit on the small side to me when you look at shields on ancient Greek vases. And we have an example in the museum of, a, of a, what we believe is an ancient hoplite shield surround. Um, I don't have the dimensions at hand, but it seems quite a bit bigger than 75 centimetres. I think it's at least a metre wide. Um, I was just sort of wondering whether sort of shield, hoplite shield sizes change over time or in, or in different regions. Good question. Uh, I was not clear. So, uh, no hoplite shield that I know of is only 75 centimetres. When I, when I mentioned the figure 75 centimetres, that was speaking of Macedonian shields, which uh, do not have these pronounced rims, uh, but are not. But some of them are significantly larger than the 60 centimeters that people used to estimate. Hoplite shields basically range. The average is about 90 centimeters, 
and they range pretty much uh, between 80 and a meter. So if you have one that's a meter, that would be on the, on the big end. There's at least one I, that I've heard of, I think that's a meter 20. So there, there is possible that there's one even bigger than that. Uh, but it's also possible that some of them weren't really made for use, but were for show in a parade or for specifically for a burial. But the typical hoplite shield is between 80 and 100. So there's two, the two shields on the, on the wall painting of that tomb that I think those two figures are both well under five feet tall. Okay, I don't think anybody thinks that guards, Macedonian guards would be under five feet tall. So if you blow them up to be, you know, five, seven or five, eight, then those shields are within that range of hop white shields. And since they do look like they have a rim and they do have emblems, they look like hop white shields to me. Okay, there were multiple times up, but we've got time for just one more question. So uh, so just briefly then, um, this, is, this is a very interesting sort of the iconographic evidence, but um, so there, I was just wondering how these, the two little bits that we find from literary evidence fit into your story. So the one, Diodorus said that Alexander led the finest of the Macedonians, and Plutarch tells us that the sacred band whom we face um, died against the Sarissae. Um, so those two, I don't know if you can account for those two elements, how they fit into this sort of reimagining of Carnea. All right, I'm probably going to forget the first one, but so the second one first. So don't give him the, don't take the microphone away so he can remind me of the one I'll forget. Um, so the Sarissa is, uh, I don't, I, I'm not sure why that's a problem. I, I'm perfectly happy to have Macedonians having Sarissas. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm not trying to suggest it's a problem. I was just wondering how, how they fit into your, into your story. Because of course you can't wield the Sarissa if you're carrying how much you. So, uh, so another really good question would be, could you use a hop white shield with a sarissa? What exactly is a sarissa? One recent view, and I'm not an expert on Macedonian equipment, so. But one view is that sarissa just means spear in Macedonian. And, and it got the meaning that we all think of it with because the most famous Macedonian spear became the one that, you know, is on the order of five meters long. Uh, so if the, if the spears were, I mean, that's a really long spear. Could you, but could you ha have used a uh, Macedonian long spear? A hoplite spear is typically a, you know, a little taller than a person, two meters tall. So if you had, even those ones that the guard said, three meters tall, could you have used that with a hoplite shield? Uh, I think that would be an interesting test for somebody to do. In Peter Connolly's article on the Sarissa, he is using a shield that has a double grip. So it's, it's not the double grip that would make it impossible to do, because you could, you know, you've got the shield on your shoulder, or maybe even with a strap around your neck, so you could potentially use your other hand too with the spear. So I don't have any problem uh, with Alexander's men using Sarissa's Somebody once tried to say, well, this shows that the cavalry used the Sarissa first, which, you know, we don't have to have Alexander in charge of cavalry. So I, I wouldn't go there. What was the other passage? No, I did uh, forget. The other thing is just the diagnosis. And I think this actually supports the argument that he says that Alexander was stationed on that wing with the finest of the Macedonians, which might suggest that they are the ones who Actually, I think, it's, I think it's Philip. Okay. Philip, um, Philip is the one who has the picked men. Alexander has good generals with him, but nice. Philip has picked men with him. Yeah. So what I, so I, you know, I don't know that I've got the final word on Chironia yet, but what I'm, what I'm tempted to think is that Philip had at least some, not necessarily the whole mass, but at least a significant body of them much more heavily armed, which they could do because they were pretty damn close to professional soldiers, so they were much better trained. Uh, if the Athenians were facing troops that were in better shape and could fight longer, that fits exactly what Polyanus says happened in the battle. That, uh, Philip, ex that Philip extended the length of the battle and uh, wore the Athenians down. So I, I, I think it's completely, I don't see any contradictions with the very scant literary sources for the battle. Okay. People who don't know that the two that he mentioned, they're 300 or more years after the battle. The fullest source, Diodorus, on the Battle of Chironia, which is a hugely important battle, I don't know, it's maybe two pages long, and it's written 300 years later. Okay, 
know, unfortunately, we're going to have to do it uh, here. I think, uh, apologies to the many people who've been uh, holding up their uh, hands, but uh, Peter will be around over lunch and hopefully you'll be able to ask some of the questions you can get. So let's uh, thank you very much again for the